John chapter 7, verse 37. Oh, Lord, I'm going to preach this. It says this, now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, <laughs> from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Holy Ghost, the spirit whom those who believed in him were to receive. For at this point in time, the spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. I'm going to read that again just because it's so good. Hopefully I can make it make sense more. It says, now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, if anybody is thirsty, let him or her come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. I feel like preaching. But this he spoke of the spirit. whom those who believed in him were to receive for the spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Mm -mm -mm. Today, Father, thank you for your word. It's already blessed. I'm going to be teaching from the subject, water it down. Water it down. Water it down Christianity. I'm going to have fun today. So, can I, can I just... Take out my frustrations on this text. Is that all right? <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Lucy. I have permission now. <laughs> this is so interesting because this is Pentecost Sunday, and you know, I do things backwards here, as you guys have probably noticed and picked up on. We did our Holy Spirit series in February, <laughs> titled Uncensored. And I feel like there's nothing less I can, nothing left I can more I can say. I feel like we've kind of tapped it out. But today is a wonderful day to celebrate the giving of God's Spirit. And I'm gonna try to do my best to make something very clear to us. And to do that, let us allow the Bible to be utilized. <laughs> let us go another verse. 1 Corinthians 13. It's going to be one of those today. <laughs> we're going to be in the Bible, and we're going to talk, because I want to talk about watered-down Christianity. I want to talk about watered-down Christianity, because huh? 1 Corinthians 13, because so many of us are in situations in states where we where the world is trying to get us to conform to their image and picture of Jesus. We can't be Bible, biblically based Christians anymore because it is not politically correct or acceptable to be as the word of God tells us to be. To serve Jesus as the word of God tells us to. As a matter of fact, can I just, let me just, I'm here, so we might as well just go all the way in. Is that when we think about Christianity and where Christianity has come in America in the last 50 years, what we will notice is this, is that there has been a severe watering down of Christianity. You can even go back beyond 50 years. You can go back 100 years. You can go back 200 years. There has been a watering down of Christianity where once this nation, we had money now that was that before it became digital and you got on your crypto fashion because ain't no there are no coins, there are no models on your Bitcoin, your Dogecoin, your, your Doge, your Ethereum, Lite, Classic. There's no, there's no models on that. But, but on this currency that they printed, they said emphatically, in God, we trust. And now you can't even say God. 
That's what Pastor Dean was telling us a couple weeks ago. You can't even say God anymore on platforms in our country because we have watered down Christianity. Oh, God, can I say what I feel? Can I say what I feel today? Hallelujah. Let Water it down. We watered it down so much that, that it's be, it used to be the central point of our nation. Y'all going to be mad at me for this, that we used to have the, con- the, the conglomeration of what we would call the state and church, where we would have no differentiation between what was church and what was the natural world, where now we have a delineation where you, we can't even go, I got to beg you to come to church on Sundays, not y'all. Y'all egg me on. Y'all say, go ahead, Pastor, preach. I'm coming. (laughs) We got to beg people to come to church. We got to tell people. We got to say, God bless you, Sister Lott. (laughs) We got to tell people. We got to find ways and excuses and reasons to get people who call themselves Christians. to come to church because we've watered it down because we've started with, you know what they say? Jesus told us this pertaining to the kingdom of God, but he was talking about yeast. He said a little yeast leavens the whole lump. I mean that you don't need a lot of a change in order to impact the entire scope of something. Jesus said just a speck of yeast and a lump of bread will cause the entire bread to rise up because it is that powerful. But what the enemy has done is by making us desensitized and causing us to lose our passion and zeal and fervor for God and the things of God. He's caused us and he's allowed us to become desensitized and even to become uh, 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 apathetic towards the things of God. Whereas now we used to be at church four days a week. Now we're lucky if we give people one. Once a month. I'm talking about across the nation. I'm not throwing shots at nobody. This is a stat in America. This is in America. In America is where pastors are are retiring and dropping out and quitting at a record pace because of the fact that not only do we have watered down Christianity, but we got watered down people preaching and leading the church. We have a problem where we can't even, now granted, it has been abused and beaten over our heads sometimes, but we can't even tell you that holiness is right without you feeling uncomfortable. We, we can't tell you, we can't tell you anymore that, 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 that we have to live, it, to be a Christian means that you have to obey what Jesus says anymore. Because we got this thing called my truth. Y'all have heard of that? Well, my truth is that this and that and this and that. Okay. Well, well, the Bible says your truth is great, but we are serving the truth. <laughs> Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so if you're trying to serve God your way, I'm trying to serve my God, God my way, but I'm not doing it Jesus' way. Then we have watered down Christianity. I'm just ranting for a little bit. Don't worry. We're going to get into this. I'm just trying to set you up for this alley-oop. Water down Christianity. To the point so much that we have, y'all don't, I don't know if you guys know about this, and shout out to every Bible-believing kingdom, covenant, new covenant, born-again believer in the United Methodist Church, but they're going through this thing right now because they have been so bullied and so uh, harassed by the LGBTQIA portion of uh, the delegation of that church that they have, they are creating a separate denomination in order to accommodate people who want to serve their own lusts and passions rather than submit themselves to the will and the system of God. Because we've watered down Christianity. How does that happen? How does it happen to say, where well, I love my mess so much. We, we used to, we, we, listen, when we used to sin, we used to know it was wrong. <laughs> Maybe y'all didn't. Okay. Well, when I used to sin, (laughs) and I put an asterisk on used to, (laughs) because every once in a while we are prone to fall. Hallelujah. But, But here's the thing, though, is that you know it's wrong. 
I'm not I'm not going to come and make a church. <laughs> Let me be careful. <laughs> For my type. <laughs> my type church of God in Christ. <laughs> Put your imagination on that. <laughs> my type new greater Baptist missionary Baptist church. My my desire. <laughs> A.M.E. Zion. <laughs> no, no. My proclivity. Lutheran Church of America. We, I didn't, we didn't do that. It was like, you know you was wrong. You sit in the back and you don't come up until you feel the release. <laughs> that's how we used to. That's how we used to sit. That's how we used to do our dirt. Because although we was wrong, we still knew that you can't, you know, compromise what God has said. Now we start our own churches based off of the wrong and the sin that God has told us to forsake. He said flee fornication. He didn't say to formate. He didn't say to form formation. He said to flee it. But we're going to build our own organization so that we can justify it. How, Sway? Now, again, y'all know me. Uh, everybody can get it. We're not here. I'm not putting anybody down. This is not LGBTQ. I hate. This is not homophobia. This ain't no phobia. This is that Jesus is Lord, period. And if we're going to be Christians and kingdom people, we got to recognize that we do not get to call the shots, nor do we get to dictate what is accurate or acceptable in the body of Christ. He purchased us with his blood, not our blood with him. No, I mean, we didn't purchase him with our blood. He purchased us. And so Paul says we are not our own we are bought with a price so we got to glorify God in our bodies oh see this is the kind of stuff that we can't say because we've watered down Christian now I just got to tell you that it's okay that here's 17 relationship steps for you here's how you know that you're going to be all right you can keep your mind and your sanity but in try to telling you that listen you got to get right because you got to align yourself with what Jesus principles are because if we're not then we are out of order and if we are out of order we cannot receive the inheritance that God has for us what does he say Paul says he says no fornicator adulterer murderer shall inherit the kingdom of God you can't escape. You can't remove it out of there. You cannot change it out of there. God, no liar, no backstabber, no gossiper, no carouser, no covetous person can inherit the kingdom of God. Because believe it or not, our God is a holy God. Our God is a righteous God. And if we're going to approach him and say we are in him, we have to align ourselves with what he has released in us. It's not yours. It's not yours. This is not our church. This is not our movement. We got to do what Jesus says. And we are in a state where, you, let me tell you why. Let me, let me tell you why. This is so crazy. Because America has been blessed. Let me tell you this. Now, granted, hear my heart. For all my social SJWs out there, social justice warriors, I love you. I am on the battlefield for justice and for equality and all this. So don't, you know, don't take this the wrong way. I'm for us. I'm for the struggle. I'm for righteousness on all fronts. But, but here's one thing that I do know that has occurred is because America has been uh, so prosperous and so friendly to Christianity, we have mistaken their friendliness for the fact that we can be off our posts because the t America has been relatively safe on her borders. We've not had any invasions probably since the War of 1812. Was, well, that wasn't even us. That was in Cuba. Probably since the uh, French and Indian War, American Revolution, and then the, um, you know, what they were doing with the, in, what's the, t for the, I don't want to say Indians, because I know that's not politically correct. What's the proper term? Native Americans. And there's another word. Indigenous people. You know, I'm trying to, you know, not get canceled this week. Um, <laughs> but for the indigenous people, that was probably the last war that we've had within our land, no, Pearl Harbor, when they attacked, um, you know, the Japanese attacked um, the people at Midway and at Pearl Harbor. But, but here's what I'm trying to tell you, though, is that we've been safe from violence. We have a government that is friendly or has been friendly to Christianity. And so because of that, we are living in relative ease pertaining to our faith and the need to be hyper or even aggressive or desperate 
for the kingdom of God because we have a system that has been built off of platforms and pieces of the kingdom of God. Believe it or not, you may hate it, but 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 America's foundation, the principles that guide America that are based on those are kingdom principles. You may not like it. I'm not talking about slavery. I'm not talking about, um, quote unquote, white supremacy. I'm not talking about um, uh, inequality. I'm talking about the principles that freedom and that liberty and that these are things that God has given every human being. That is a that is a kingdom principle. I know. Like what? How you go from water down to this? Because I'm about to show you. Because because we have a nation that has been built and centered and friendly to Christianity. We don't have to be on our P's and Q's like other places in the world. We don't have to be like some of our uh, family in Nigeria who have to worry about be their daughters and sons being kidnapped by Boko Haram. We don't have to worry about our children being uh, uh, indoctrinated with, with uh, radical terroristic regimes and mindsets because here in America, we're relatively safe. We don't have to worry about, thank God, as much anymore, explosions and bombings of our, of our churches. We don't have to meet in basements, afraid of the government coming and murdering us and killing us, executing us for violating the, the laws which says you cannot worship Jesus Christ in this nation. That's that China, by the way, in case y'all didn't know what I was referring to. This China that they want us to be so friendly with, but I'm not going to get political today. I'm just saying you got to be careful what you're allowing in your room, in your bed, because if you bring in that mindset, they're going to take away and wipe out the little piece of religious freedom and opportunity that we have as Christians in America. But here's why this is important. Because we don't have problems, we don't have concerns or fears about that stuff, we don't feel a need to be as devoted as others are. Because we are not fighting a holy war like some of our uh, friends who are uh, who are. Islamic, not friends as in we know them. I'm just saying our brothers and sisters in the human and a human capacity. They're fighting a jihad. They got something to live for because why? The, look at the Middle East. Look at what's so-called Middle East. Look at what's happening <laughs> in Israel. Thousands and thousands of rockets being fired. Now, when the last time you've seen a rocket? Last time you saw a rocket red glare was in the national anthem. <laughs> See, those people got to pray to their God, even though it's not getting results, because they have a des they have a desperation. Here, let me tell you why this is so important, because here in America, we don't have that. So we have it easy. This is what happens when you have entitled children versus children who have to work and who have to deal with the reality of struggle and the potential of loss because you have a different mindset. The mindset of America, and particularly Christianity, is that we don't have to do all that because we got it easy. Because we don't, listen, if, if COVID comes, don't worry, the government gonna write us checks. We gonna get stimulus. Don't worry, if I, if I get fired, don't worry, I got unemployment insurance. Don't want, you know what? When I hit a certain age, I'm going to retire. My life is going to be swell. It's going to be easy. We think this is the normal, but it's not the norm. 90% of the world does not retire at 65. <laughs> Most of them work till they die <laughs> or they exist in dire poverty and die. <laughs> what we have in here is unique. And so as a result, our desire and our need for God has been watered down. So I'm trying to show you. The people overseas in, in, in uh, 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 the so-called Middle East, they, they can pray. They, you know, they pray the Islam miss five times, maybe more, five or six times a day, facing the East religiously every single day. You can't be a Muslim and say you don't do that. <laughs> A real Muslim, they're going to they gonna call you out. But here in America, guess what? You can be a Christian, and you don't have to have any kind of evidence or any kind of fruit. 
So don't take all that. I'm not saying you got to do stuff, but I'm saying that if we are Christians, shouldn't our lives look like it? Shouldn't our lives resemble what the Bible says we should do? Shouldn't we be loving one another? Shouldn't we be forgiving one another? Shouldn't we we be walking in power? Heck, shouldn't we come to church if we're Christians? Lay them down. Here's what I'm trying to tell you, friends. Uh, listen, I, I'm, my rant is about done because I'm wasting my time ranting. This is part of my intro. This is all strategic. <laughs> but I'm telling you this because we are in a state where now, watch this, less than 50% of the nation identifies as active Christians. 20 years ago, it was like at 60 to 75%. Now, less than 50%. How does that happen? Definitely part of the pandemic. But if you also think about it, you think this is what we've sown. The Bible says you reap what you sow. So if you sow lack of devotion, if you sow that you know, you don't really got to go to church. It's not important. I'm going to do this on my own. What? If you sow that, you're going to reap that and more. Now, let me get to the point. Y'all all right? All right, that's my rant for today. I'm trying to explain this water down to you. This watered down Christianity, it is causing us to have to wear, not even my generation, the millennials. Now, yeah, I'm a millennial. Believe it or not. <laughs> they call me a geriatric millennial, though. I saw that term today because I'm at the tail end. I'm at the beginning of it, yeah. I feel it. I feel all of it. I feel my knees aching in my millennialism. Hallelujah. Because I'm too fly. <laughs> uh but but here's the thing though is that my generation we we're saying that one church is not important two that we want to change the scope of it these are things that i've read i mean i read a lot about our generation um clearly i do such a great job reaching us right and uh and um Everybody over 45, raise your hand, right? But anyways, <laughs> but here's the thing, though, is that we are shifting further and further away from being believing that even God is real. The God of the Bible exists, and it's because we've sown watered-down Christianity over. It's y'all fault. I hate the blame game, but it's y'all fault. This is why the Bible tells us that we ought to train up a child in the way that he should go. So when he's young, he won't depart from it. You know, we got this thing, and I, and I hate it, and I'm, I'm, I'm almost done. The Lord is telling me to hurry up. Is that we got this thing, and I see it on TV, where people say when you get married, we're going to let our child decide what they want. We're going to let our child decide. Well, if they want to do that, religion, that's, you, that don't exist in the Bible. <laughs> Ain't no... If you ra- if you raise in the in the Israelite nation, ain't no like, well, if you want to try, you know, Asherism, go ahead. He's hey, listen, little uh little Reuben over here, you know, he wants to try it, we're gonna let him do that. No, the Bible says this is that it's the parents' duty and responsibility to raise them up in the righteousness. Even if they don't want to, it's your responsibility as parents to force it on them. I shouldn't force them. No, it's your responsibility because that's why God has placed them in our lives is so that we could put on them his principles and his realities because what we're doing is sowing into them because every seed that is planted does not reap right away. So we sow and we plant because there's going to come a day in time when what has sown is going to come into collision with the, re- with the reality and the idea of God. But if we don't sow anything, when the time comes for them to have need, they're going to look other places and remembering than, than other, excuse me, than looking for where God has 
where they know God is because they're going to look for it in the stars. They're going to look for it in the zodiac. They're going to look. I ran into a witch out here a couple days ago. She said, I'm a, she said, yeah, I'm an occultist. I just joined it. I'm like, oh, that's dope. I said, you should try to come to church sometime, you know. I'm like, Jesus is real. But no, she has no desire or need because to her it is le- – the, the, the idea of occultism is realer to her than – more real to her than the reality of Jesus. And that's on her. That's fine. I mean, it's not fine, but you understand what I'm saying. It's because what are we sowing in the people? What are we sowing into our children? So parents, do not, do not forsake nor neglect your responsibility as parents as custodians of God's gifts to put on our children the responsibility of, of the, responsi- the responsibility and the burden of bringing kingdom understanding and intelligence to our children. This is why God chose Abraham because God said in a- uh, Genesis 18 and 19 that I can trust Abraham that he will pass on my standards of righteousness, of judgment, and truth to generations on. God chose Abraham not just because he was willing to go, but because he was able to disciple and to raise up generations generations after him to follow the exact same model that he followed in searching God and walking in righteousness and pursuing after truth found in the one true and living God. And so our job as parents is to do the exact same thing. But if we let up on our duty, we going to have bums like little Nas who's dancing on a fake little Nas X dancing on a fake Satan leading and raising our kids and telling them about the old town road and all that foolishness. And they're going to be lost in there because we off our duty because we have water down. Christianity. Now, I'm going to the Bible now. My rent is officially over. Let me get back to the Bible. Yeah, 1 Corinthians 13. Because we're talking about the Holy Ghost. Because this is also part of watered-down Christianity. Because what they've done is this they, whoever they is. Hallelujah. That's what we're going to talk about today. They. We're talking about them today. Glory to God. Is that what they've done is this. They've told us this, that to be Christian, it is just about being nice. That's what I started talking about with Jesus, just about being nice. Because Jesus was just nice. He was just a kind person. He wouldn't step. They remember the story of the Samaritan, but they don't remember the story of the Jesus who, or the story of the woman who got caught in adultery. Where he, the, the story of the Samaritan, you know, the good Samaritan, where the only person who actually helped the guy in need was the least likely. You remember that? Right. That's the one the world tells you, you got to be a good Samaritan. Be like Jesus. Help those who are in need. OK. What about when he told the woman, go and sin no more? What about that, Jesus? <laughs> no, we don't. We don't believe in that, Jesus. W- what about the Jesus that says this? If any man must follow, come after me, he must take up his own cross. What about that? They just want the Jesus that feed people that do outreaches. <laughs> They don't want the Jesus that says, you, if you want to follow me, you got to die. You got to lose yourself if you want to follow this Jesus. See, because if we don't get the real Jesus, then we cannot have real Christianity, friends. How can you have a Jesus? Come on. How can you follow a Jesus and say you're a Christian if you are not submitted to his will and to his ways and what he asks us to do? And this verse, what I'm about to show you in Corinthians 13, is a part of why they Try to make us water down the wrong way. And I'm telling you, I'm going to get in trouble. Not by nobody here. But I was arguing on social media yesterday. Because people get mad because we've abused what it means to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Because we told people you're going to be saved. Sometimes you got to speak in tongues. I grew up in a church like that. We don't believe that here. You know, we, we were born again by belief. The Bible said you confess with your mouth, Lord Jesus, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And we believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost, but I don't believe the only sign is the evidence of speaking tongues. I don't believe that. I don't think that's scriptural. But I think that is a sign, and I think that you ought to have a spiritual language. I think you should. I think it is your right and your privilege to have a spiritual language. You should pray in the Holy Ghost. Please say amen to that. Because this is your privilege. But what happens is this. We say, well, because that's hard. How do I know it's real? Let's talk about the Holy Ghost, Pastor Bob. How, how do I know it's real? How do I know it's not real? That's what it sounds like. That's what it feels like. I'm just like, how do I know that's real? How do I know that God has really filled me? How do I know that? How do I know that when I lay hands on the sick, they're going to recover? How do I know that when I quote unquote prophesy or give the word of the Lord that this is accurate? How do I know that? Because it's no way to justify because it's hard. 
It's hard. Come on, you've seen it. Maybe it's been you. I, I grew up in a church where there was this one lady who, because we didn't have the, the, the advanced, not even advanced, but the proper understanding of Scripture, there was a lady who was trying to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost probably my whole darn near childhood. Every Sunday, coming up, praying, trying to beg God for something that he released already, and going back disappointed year after year after year after year after year. You know why this is important? It's because stuff like that makes, it, makes us feel that, man, you don't really got to do that to be saved. Having that kind of disappointment to say, God, I pray for somebody, and they didn't get healed, says, well, maybe it's not what we thought it was. Man, well, telling somebody the word of the Lord that you thought, say, God, you know, I thought this is what you told me, and I told him this, and it was totally off. Anybody ever had that? I have. And so we say, just back up, don't even do it. Because it's really, that's not what's really important. We'll, we'll go here. We'll say, you know what, verse 1, if I speak with tongues of men and of angels but do not have love, I become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and, all myst- and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but don't have love, I'm nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned but do not have love, it profits me nothing. And so we'll tell people, it don't matter about your gifts if you don't have love. You could eat ba 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 all day, but if you don't have love, it don't mean nothing. And so we will water down the fact that God told us that he gave us these gifts and these opportunities to flow in the supernatural to counteract the supernatural devil that we are against. Y'all know the devil is supernatural. <laughs> he's not just like a, he's not just like some like, a, he's not a math problem, you know. <laughs> he's not a boogeyman. He actually has capabilities and capacities. Yeah. And so how can we fight a devil that has metaphysical powers if all we're saying is, you know what, I'm just going to be happy. I'm just going to be a nice person. You, You can't do it. Friends, it's impossible. But what they will tell us? Because we have often abused and been on the wrong side of, of, of practicum when it comes to Pentecostalism, where people screaming over you, say Jesus, 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 Jesus. Somebody telling you to let go. Somebody telling you to hold on. At this. I'm like, I don't know what to do. Am I holding on? Am I letting go? Who am I calling? I'm slobbering. It's sweaty. I've been at this on this wooden chair for 35 minutes, and nothing's happened. That was my experience growing up. We had the chair. You had to come down and tarry. You say, Jesus, 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 and Joe, you know, maybe something happened. And they got the mothers on the church yelling in your ear, hold on. The other one on the ear is saying, let go. I'm like, trying to figure out, like, what do I do while keeping up my repetitions of Jesus's per minute? 35 Jesus is per minute is the rate that you need to tarry at. (laughs) But because it's been hard and because we have had wrong practice, we'll tell you, you know what, just don't worry about that. As the Beatles told us, all you need is love. Because if if you got love, if you don't have love, it don't matter if you prophesy. If you don't have love, it don't matter if, 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 you, if you can heal the sick because you need love. And so we've watered down the supernatural aspect of Christianity because it's hard and because we've done it wrong. I really want to show you this. I've seen so many clips of people saying, you can prophesy, but you don't have love. It means nothing. You might as well shut up. No, I'm going to keep prophesying. <laughs> I'm going to just try to be nicer. <laughs> I'm going to keep laying hands on the sick. I'm going to just try to be nicer. I'm just going to try to love you. You don't, you don't know how hard it is to love you, though. That's the problem. <laughs> People who tell you to love the most are the ones who often are the least, are the, the, the least easiest to love. But don't look at your neighbor right now and say that. But I was in a conversation, and again, you, this will make sense in 10 minutes, I promise you. I was in a conversation yesterday. And they were telling me, we were talking about the baptism of the Holy Ghost and what it means. And, and people say, I don't care if you're baptized, I don't care if you speak in tongues, if you don't, but you're still nasty. 
but you still have flaws. And to be the ones who run around the church the most, saying Ibo Shata, prophesying, who often have the worst lives in spite of being filled with the Holy Ghost. And so that makes people hate and dislike the reality of the Holy Spirit and his baptism because we don't have a life that lines up to the power that we've been given. But if, friends, it's not either or. I just want to tell you this. It's both and. We need the power and we also need the responsibility. We need the, the, uh, the character as well as the charisma of God. The charisma gives. We need it all. It's not either or. So what I'm trying to tell you is this, is that although we need love, Paul is not telling us to throw away prophecy. He's not telling us to throw away laying hands on the sick. He's not telling us to throw away speaking in tongues. He's saying this is that if you're going to do it, at least be nice to people. Don't be a jerk. Because it just makes it nasty. You ever you ever been somewhere? And, and I swear to you, you ever been somewhere and, you you, you know, I, I don't like chitterlings. Yeah, I don't know that. Maybe you do. I don't like chitterlings. I don't hate on anybody who eats them. If you like places that fecal matter has been, that's on you. <laughs> if you like it, hey, do your thing, right? I, that's not for me. Because when I smell it, it changes my appetite. It could be good. Some of y'all swear by it. For me, when I smell the chitterling, I don't want to eat for a week. <laughs> I see our beloved pastor is a fan of the chitlins. I would have thought y'all would have been too proper up there in London to, to eat the chitterlings. <laughs> but here's the thing, though. For me, it changes my whole appetite when I smell it. <laughs> this is the same thing that the Bible is talking about in terms of if you have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but you don't have character, mm. is that you can come, you can have a great meal, but the smell of it is so repulsive that many people won't want to eat it. I'm many people. <laughs> I'm not trying to hate on your favorite food. Trust me, I'm not. <laughs> but this is what the Apostle Paul is saying. He's not saying that you should throw away the chitlins, although I'm saying you should throw away the chitlins. <laughs> hey, maybe call it a different name, too. <laughs> but the point is this, though, is that if you have the baptism of the Holy Ghost, but if you don't have love, then it creates a smell. So God, Apostle Paul is not saying throw out the chitlins. He's saying it just, let's make it smell better. Some of you have perfected how to not make them smell like what they really are. <laughs> God bless you. This is what the Apostle Paul is saying. He's saying clean your chitlins. That's the name of this message, clean your chitlins. And I'm done. Let the church say amen. Clean your chitlins. Yeah. Oh, where I got it. I got it. Don't start. Don't 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 make me clean your chitlins. <laughs> yeah. Clean your chitlins. Now, now, here's the thing, though. So we're not throwing away chitlins. We're just saying clean them. But here's the problem, though, is that what we've done is because we've watered down Christianity, we're saying let's get rid of chitlins altogether. metaphorically speaking. And that's not what God has said, it, because again, it is a gift. He's given this to us. This is what Jesus said, and we read it in John 7. He says, if you believe on me, as the scripture says, out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. So, so the question is this, how can we throw away something and, and deny something that Jesus himself said, this is my gift to you? He said, not only that, he says, this is what I'm coming. He, said, he, says, he says, if any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. 
Come on. And he says, and if he believe on me, as the scripture says, out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. Now, here's why this is so important for us, because we got to understand that this idea of the baptism of the Holy Ghost is for you today. But, but what we're not realizing it is meant to solve a thirst. Is that we've got the wrong watered down Christianity. We, we got the Christianity that says where the devil can give us his drink. He can give us his philosophies. He can give us his mindsets. He can give us his appetites and his pleasures. But God is saying, listen, if you come to me and drink, I will give you something where you will never thirst again. Isn't that what he told the woman at the well? He said, I got a drink for you that if you drink for me, listen, you will never have to come to this well again because it will produce in you life everlasting. But the baptism of the Holy Ghost is designed to give you access to water. It's meant to give you access to water. We, we talk about power, power, Lord, power, power. We listen, I love it. I sing it all day, right? But, but here's what Jesus has come to do. He's come to give you water. He's come to give you access to something that will quench your thirst because you have a thirst for something in life that is more than what you can give yourself. You have a thirst for some things that's more than what relationships can give you. That's more than what your job can give you. That's more than what you and looking in the mirror and getting the newest clothes and, and, and having the the latest drip can give you. You need something that the world cannot give you, that your money cannot give you, that your looks cannot give you, that your government cannot give you, that culture cannot give you. And Jesus says, I have a drink for you. I have something for you that if you trust me, if you believe on me, as the scripture says, out of your belly will begin to flow and release rivers, fountains of flowing water. Now, here's why this is so important. I say this all the time, but but you got to see this here because here is the question. Because Jesus, how do we believe on you as the scripture said? Well, here's the first point, and I'm getting ready to close. Is this, is that when we come to Jesus, hallelujah, we have to understand that to receive this promised gift of the baptism of the Holy Ghost, it comes from Jesus. It don't come from hard work. It don't come from labor. But it comes from the fact that Jesus is the root and the foundation of our covenant realities with God. And when we believe in Jesus, glory to God, we become, we get access and we come eligible to receive this promise of the baptism of the Holy Ghost, which is this water, which is this drink, which is this empowerment for living that will allow you to move and to function in destiny like you need to. I'm going somewhere. And so Jesus is the root of it. So if we come to Jesus, you can always get it. Thank you, Lord. Jesus will never say no to you to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Jesus will never tell you no if you're hungry. I don't have food for you. Jesus will never tell you no if you're thirsty. I don't have a drink for you because if you come to me glory to God he says I will give you something and I'm going to make this tap unlimited thank God for the biggie cup thank God for supersizing but Jesus says I'm going to dump a river in your spirit I'm going to dump an ocean in your spirit that, that means that no matter where you go no matter what you go through that there's going to be an everlasting eternal flow in your spirit that will always cause you to have what you need in the moment that you need it glory to God come on he told us to pray in Matthew chapter Chapter 6, he said, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He said, Give us this day our daily bread. Friends, I'm telling you, Jesus got bread and he's got drink for you. You don't got to worry about him running out. You don't got to worry about him not having enough for you. If you come to him for what he promises you, he always gives it. Always. So he says, come to me and drink. Come to me and drink. Hallelujah. And, and this is the thing is that, is that we have to drink it. And this is why some of us may have yet to receive the fullness of what Jesus has given us. is because we take a sip and we're like, mm. we go home. We, we take a sip and say, man, I'm tired of this song. We, we, we take a sip and, and we fall asleep. Let's just be real. We, we take a sip, but we don't drink and drink. And you know how it is tonight, today, when you go out, you're going to be hit by a heat wave. And that heat wave is going to hit you, and you're like, man. And you say, I need something to drink. You're not going to just be like with your pinky up like, Tch. I'm squeezing this bottle. Like, I'm getting every ounce of every drop out of this water bottle because when you're thirsty, you drink it all. 
until you cannot take anymore. Jesus didn't say if any man has an appetite for a bit of a beverage. <laughs> he didn't say, listen, man, you know. Some of y'all, I drink a little. I saw some of y'all, I drink a little. I don't drink all the time. Some people have an appetite for it. <laughs> some people are thirsty for alcohol. Others just drink a little bit. Just a little bit. I don't eat it all the time. Just sometimes go with the right meal. It's, you know, it is what it is. And so some, you don't, sometimes, you, you know, you don't, some of us have bottles that are years old in our cabinets. Some of us. <laughs> that just go down inch by inch. Others, bottles don't make it to the week. <laughs> it's because we have different tastes. Different tastes for it. I'm just trying to illustrate this point so you can see it. Jesus says, if you thirst, the question is, do you thirst? Because if you thirst, you're not just going to want a little sip. If you're thirsty, you're not just going to say, oh, okay, that was cute. If, if you're thirsty, you're going you're gonna to be ugly with it. You can't be cute and be thirsty at the same time. You, you, you're going to be like, you know what? You're going to be making noises. It's going to be coming down the side of your mouth. Yeah, you're like, yo, I'm thirsty. I don't even care. It don't matter how look because you thirst because you want more of it. You got to have it all. And this is what Jesus is saying. If any man is thirsty. See, one of the reasons why many of us have yet to be filled or receive it is because we've not been thirsty. The prerequisite is not being saved because you got to be saved. In order, well, not theoretically, you just got to be thirsty. It don't even matter if you saved. If you're thirsty for Jesus, you can be filled because you can be filled before you actually get saved. As we see in the scripture multiple times. The only prerequisite. To this gift that Jesus given us, given us, has given us is thirst. He says, if you're thirsty, I, I got you. But see, we, 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 because we've watered down church, we tell you, you don't got to be thirsty for Jesus. You, you don't got to want him. You don't got to want him. It's cool to have him in the back pocket. But, but sometimes we got to get into a place where we're thirsty, which is why when tragedy hit America in 9-11, we got thirsty. When 2008 came and the recession came, we got thirsty. Some of y'all in 2017, when the president Trump got elected, y'all got thirsty. <laughs> right. Some of y'all in 2020, when Joe Biden got elected, <laughs> you got thirsty. Or your car got thirsty. I don't know, whichever, whichever one that is. Come back to it. We got to be thirsty. Somebody got $91 for a full tank of gas. I'm like, golly. <laughs> Anyways, that's not his fault, though. But um, <laughs> we got to have thirst. Let me jump. I ran it too long, and so I'm over time. But, but here's the moral. So here's why this story matters is because Jesus is saying this. He says we got to have thirst. We got to come to him and drink. Here's how you receive. You get thirsty. You can be thirsty. You don't got to be thirsty at church. You can carry thirst with you wherever you go. You can be at home thirsty and you can receive from God. There are many people who receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit in their homes, not even a church service, because you don't, it's not the mother's praying over you. It's not somebody touching you in your stomach with a how. It's not that. It's your thirst. And if you can maintain a thirst, glory to God, then you will get from Jesus what he has promised you. Now, here's where I got to wrap this up. Glory to God is because when Jesus is referring to is he's I'm, I like rap hip hop. And a lot of times they will sample music, you know, samples. This mean where you take a old a song that came before you and you remake it into a new song. And you use part of it, and you make it into the record. And so what Jesus is doing is he's sampling right here. You may not see it, but he's sampling. And this is why I love this verse. And it screamed at me like never before this past week. And, and what I saw was this, is that Jesus says, well, he says, if any man thirsts, 
And I'm literally closing. Let him come to me and drink. And if he believes on me, as the scripture says, out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. But here's the thing. There is no scripture (laughs) where the Bible says, if you believe in Jesus, out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. And I was like, what? Because I was looking. I was like, Lord, where? I'm like, where is this scripture said that? Because I want to know how to believe on you. Is it in Revelation? No, that was after. Was it in Acts? No, that was after. Was it in Malachi? Wasn't in Malachi. Wasn't in Zechariah. Wasn't in Ezekiel. Wasn't in Micah. Wasn't in Daniel. But what I found out was this. Is that Jesus was sampling what happened with Moses and the children of Israel. You, you know the story. They, they, they came out of Egypt. God brought him out with a mighty hand. You know, he, sp- he split the Red Sea. They, they crossed over on dry land. Now, now, you know, don't preach it, Dean. Jesus, man. <laughs> Is he trying to beat me to it? I hate when y'all let me preach, man. Jesus, man. <laughs> it's working. Hallelujah. I'm just joking with this for y'all. No, I'm smashing with him. But when they went through the dry land, they had food, manna on high. They said, God, we don't, we're hungry. It's three million of us. We need something to eat. He, he made manna come from heaven. And then he brought a pack of birds, and they had more meat than they knew what to do. The Bible says it was like meat, so much meat is going to come out your nose. And then it was like, we got the meat, we got the bread, but we don't have any water. Because we've been on this trip for now three days, and it's a desert, Moses, and we need water. Because the people on the road to destiny, they were thirsty. Because sometimes there comes a point when you are moving towards where God wants you to go, that, that you may have some stuff, but you don't have everything. And that's the way how destiny works is that I got the building, but I don't got the equipment. (laughs) I got the idea, but I don't have the employees. (laughs) I got the job, but I don't have a car. (laughs) But God says, I got you. Moses, here's what I want you to do. See that mountain right there? See that rock right there? (laughs) What I want you to do is I want you to take that staff that you used to cross the Red Sea. This is Exodus 17, by the way. And I want you to just smack it. Just smack it. And and what you're going to see, Moses, is that, glory to God, is that when you smack this rock, it's going to produce within it rivers of water. When, when Moses, now, friends, this wasn't the water fountain <laughs> at school where you got to twist it and you barely, you got your mouth on like, this is not that. This is not the trickle. This is, this is a stream that had to feed and supply two million people. Because if you believe on me, thank you, Jesus, like the scripture said, out of your belly or from within, glory to God, will flow out of you streams of living water. Let me give you another example. Numbers. Let's jump to Numbers. Chapter 20, verse 11. Hallelujah. And then we see Jesus again. I'm sorry. Well, they're at another place. They need more water. This time, Moses, God tells Moses, God says, Moses, listen, this time I want you to go and I want you to just say to this rock this time. You ain't even got to hit it no more. Just say to this rock, you know, <laughs> give us water. Don't hit it. Just say to this rock. Ask of this rock to release water for you. Jesus said, God, I can't even stop the sim- Can't stop the metaphor. Moses takes the staff. And he hits it hard twice. God says, Moses, what are you doing? 
Because I didn't tell you to hit it. I tell you to speak to it. Here's what God said. Moses, because you have not believed on me, as I told you, he says, you will not see the promised land. That's where you shout right there. Because where does the scriptures tell us to believe in him? I forgot to give you 1 Corinthians 10 and 4, where the Bible says that the, Mo- the Israelites were baptized into Moses. And that God, you know what, let me read it on purpose, because I got time today. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians 10, 4. It says this, and they, let me read verse 1. For I don't want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink for they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them and the rock was Christ. When Moses didn't believe on the rock he wasn't believing on Jesus here's how we bring this connection he says if you believe on me as the scripture said because where did the scripture say believe on me right there Because Jesus is saying, listen, I am the rock that was in the wilderness that gave them water and rivers of water from this mountain. He says, I was that rock. And he says, now to the new believers in the New Testament, if you believe on me, as the scripture says, instead of water coming out of the rock, I'm going to put water out of you. If you believe on me. As the scripture said, because, again, we, we don't have any premise where Jesus is stating that he's going to be the one to provide us water. But we do see him in the wilderness, in the Old Testament, as the source of water, as the source of provision, as the source of sustenance. Because you do know that you can go you can go days without food. You can go days without uh, 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 um, uh, people, but you can't really survive three days without water. Uh, so Jesus comes and tells them, listen, y'all, y'all thirsty. Ha, ha, ha. Can I offer? I, I also forgot to tell y'all that this was during the Feast of Booths. This was the, during the feast where they celebrated their time in the wilderness. So here, think about, the, think about the picture. Here is Jesus who was the rock in the wilderness that fed them and gave them what they needed while they were in the wilderness. And he's telling them this. He says, listen, if you're thirsty, hallelujah, this rock is not going to follow you anymore, but this rock is going to water you Because if you come to me and drink, you're going to come to this rock one more time and I'm going to put a stream that's going to water you down. I'm going to put a stream of life in you that's going to make you so soaking and so wet with life that it will change everything about you, that it will make your dry days glorious. It'll make your sad days happy. It'll make your uh, your unproductive days fruitful because within you there is a new dimension of watered down Christianity. Friends, what God is trying to do for us, and I didn't paint that picture too well, but he's trying to show us this, is that like that rock in the wilderness fed them and sustained sustained them, so will this rock of God. Jesus says, you believe on me, it will produce within you a stream of living water. Because he is the rock, and he is the source of water. And all we got to do is come to him. And he says this, the only way, you don't got to hit this rock. All you got to do is just ask. And you'll receive. All you got to do is just say, yeah, Lord, I want this water. Yeah, Lord, I, I'm thirsty. Yeah, Lord, I, I want more. And that's what Pentecost is about. It's about God initiating more in us to give us exactly what we need for destiny and purpose. Friends, you are all going somewhere with your saved self. You are not here by accident. You are here because God has ordained significant things for your life. And on your journey, you're going to need some water. On your journey, you're going to need God to sustain you. And he says, I'm solving that problem. He says, because no matter where you go, (laughs) 
you're going to have everything you need to live. I want to encourage somebody that feels like, man, I, I can't do this next battle of my life. I can't do this next leg. I can't, I can't do this next challenge because I'm not going to make it. You ever felt that way? I don't have enough to make it. Jesus gives us water because water is the only thing that you need. The most foundational thing that you need. If you have water, you can make it through anything. If you have water, you can survive. If you have water, because he gives us daily bread, glory to God, you're going to be able to survive in terrain that should kill you. See, Pentecost is not about shouting so much as it's about having the empowerment to get to where God has called you to (laughs) intact. Nothing missing, nothing broken. And this is what we can embrace in the spirit of Pentecost today. I want you to speak in tongues, yeah. I want you to lay hands on the sick, absolutely. But you know what I want more than that? I want, well, I want you to lay hands on the sick a lot too. But I want you to get to where God has called you to. Because if we don't get there, all our shouting and jerking and quicking and bucking, bucking, we're doing it in the desert. And we're going to die in the desert. But I'm telling you, you're not going to die in the desert. You're not going to die in drought. You're not going to die with overpriced gas. You're not going to die with escalating rent. You're not going to die when they say we're not hiring. Because God has placed within us a source of sustenance. A miracle source of sustenance. That if we can tap into this. We will never thirst for anything. You know, the highest thirst you have is for God. If that thirst is quenched, you don't really thirst for anything else. I pray today, one, that we can get out of watered-down Christianity, as the world says, so that we can become watered-down Christians, as the scriptures say so that we can receive Jesus and receive his life and receive this water. You know, when you got enough water, you can give to other people because you're overflowing. I pray that you overflow. I pray that the glory of God flows out of your life. I pray that everywhere you go, you leave puddles. I pray everywhere you go that you would bring the moisture of heaven. I pray that as you sleep, <laughs> that you would, the overflow would rejuvenate in your home. That it would revive your home. I pray that where you work, that this overflow of life Glory to God, would impact your coworkers. I pray that, thank you, Jesus, you can have more life, more love, more power as you remain thirsty. Father, I pray right now that even for our church and our ministry that you would ignite thirst like never before. I pray that we would be so thirsty that we don't want anything but you. May we be thirsty, desperate, hungry, May our stomachs growl. May our appetites become weary, insatiable. God, I need you. I want to be thirsty for you. Mm. Thank you, Jesus.